The School is Not White, a true story of the civil rights movement, written by Doreen Rappaport, illustrated by Curtis James. This is a true story about an American family. In 1965, Matthew and May Bertha Carter were sharecroppers on a cotton plantation in Mississippi, nine miles from a small town of Drew. Growing cotton is a hard life, and sharecroppers earn very little money. Like all parents, Matthew and May Bertha Carter dreamed of a better life for their children. Their children dreamed of better lives, too. In 1965, seven of the Carter's school-aged children attended all-black schools. The schools in Drew were still segregated by race then, even though the U.S. Supreme Court had declared school segregation illegal 11 years before. Like all southern black schools, theirs were inferior to the white schools in Drew. In August that year, under a new federal law, the county offered a freedom of choice plan for black children to attend any school they wanted. The Carter children signed up to go to the all-white schools. They expected other black families would send their children too. Ruth was only 16, but she felt tired, tired of the hand-me-down readers and the broken-down school bus and the patched school roof and the library that had no books. She wanted to go to white school where everything was crisp and new. Ruth did not want to end up picking cotton like Mama and Papa. Neither did her sisters and brothers. Her parents agreed. May Bertha and Matthew Carter knew a good education would get their children out of the cotton fields. They signed the papers for them to go to the all-white school. May Bertha heard the blaring horn long before she saw the pickup truck. It's starting, Matthew said softly. It was the plantation overseer. They knew he had come to order them to not send their children to the all-white school. I'll help you withdraw them, the man said. Don't need any help, answered Matthew. May Bertha smiled to herself and lugged a chair and record player out to the porch. She turned up the volume and placed the needle gently on a record, and President John F. Kennedy's voice blared louder than any truck horn. When Americans are sent to war, we do not ask for whites only. American students of any color should be able to attend any school they select without having to be backed up by troops. The president's words boomed as the pickup truck roared away, leaving only a trail of dust. That night, rifle shots pierced the walls and windows of their house. Matthew and May Bertha rocked their children in their arms until their trembling bodies quieted down. Matthew sat up all night, a shotgun at his side, guarding his family. We have to show others it can be done, and maybe they will stop being afraid, Papa said. They knew he was right, dear sweet Papa, who never wore overalls because they reminded him of slavery. On September 3, 1965, May Bertha and Matthew Carter watched their seven children go off to war in a shiny yellow school bus. Four-year-old Carl stood alongside his parents, wishing he were old enough to go with his sisters and brothers. 17-year-old Ruth, 15-year-old Larry, 13-year-old Stanley, 12-year-old Gloria, 10-year-old Pearl, 8-year-old Beverly, 6-year-old Deborah, off to war, armed only with love. The bus pulled out of sight. Matthew went off to the cotton fields. May Bertha, who rarely missed work, took to her bed and prayed for God to protect her children. Mama was waiting on the porch when the spanking clean yellow bus brought them home. How did it go today? She asked the question, even though she knew the answer. Mama did not have to hear the mocking laughter and the ugly words to know what had happened that day. She did not have to see the angry faces and raised fists and the spitballs at their heads and the kicking at their heels to know what had happened that day. She knew all too well that what had happened that day would happen every day as long as her children went to the white school. She looked into their hurt and angry eyes and reminded them, The school is not white. It's brown brick. And that school belongs to you as well as it belongs to them. Mama, who left school at third grade level, was smarter than any white teacher. The plantation owner came. He told the family there would be no cotton to pick, no house to live in, and no credit at the plantation store unless they withdrew their children. They had expected this, but not so soon. But for the Carters, there was no going back. News of their courage and troubles reached sympathetic ears. A southern black ministry group and a northern white church group sent money for food and clothing. A Quaker group provided a down payment for a house. Civil rights activists found them jobs, but it was still tough going. 
Every school day brought new stories and more of the same. Pearl's teacher told her she smelled. Papa scrubbed her every morning and washed and ironed her clothes, so when the teacher said it again, she would know it was a lie, even though the lie hurt. A white girl sometimes spoke to Deborah when no one else was around. The principal found out and told the girl not to. Whenever they took a seat in the cafeteria, their classmates jumped up as if they were poison. Ruth and Stanley and Larry stopped eating lunch until Papa found out. Beverly ate alone on the gym steps or along the wall outside and watched her classmates play. Every day after school, Gloria prayed, let tomorrow be an okay day, but it never was. Still, she never thought of quitting. Three years passed, bringing more ugly words, mocking laughter, raised fists and spitballs. Carl was now in school. One day the loneliness choked him, and his seven-year-old legs marched him out of school all the way home. I'm not going back, Mama. He crawled into bed. Mama felt his pain, as if it was hers. But still, she encouraged him to return, for she and Matthew knew that Carl's future depended on education. May Bertha wrote the teacher, she wrote the principal, she went to the school, but no matter how many letters she wrote or how many visits she made, nothing changed. Sometimes Matthew and May Bertha's love could not stop their children's pain from exploding into hate and ugly words spilled from their child children's mouths. Then Mama reminded them that people who hate cannot feel good. Love thine enemy, she quoted from the Bible. Every morning for five years, the Carter children walked as straight as tree trunks down the gravel road, carrying books that felt heavier than any hundred-pound sack of cotton. Up the steps onto the spanking clean bus where no one sat next to them, past the schoolyard where no one played with them, into the school where only unfriendly eyes met theirs, down the halls into their classrooms, ignoring the name, calling and mocking laughter and raised fists and the spitballs, ignoring it, but never getting used to it. Still, they stayed on, hoping to give courage to others, hoping to make the world a better place. Gradually, what Papa said would happen did happen. Their courage gave courage to other black families and black children signed up for the white schools. The Carter children knew that their struggle had made a difference and their parents' dream of a better life for their children came true.